Uh, this is our 22nd program that APO has put on to give evidence and facts for all of you to make decisions that you need for your various institutions. So I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, three, four weeks ago, we did have one of these town halls just focusing on Beirut. Uh, we had all the major philanthropists that do work there, the Karagoshian Foundation, the Genetian Foundation, the Armenian Medical Missionary Association, AMAA, uh, and AGBU. Uh, speak to uh, what they were doing there in sharing with us all of the problems that were ongoing and how they were successfully dealing with it. But now, unfortunately, there was this devastating explosion, uh, which has caused a tremendous amount of devastation and has impacted many people, uh, some of the people on the phone today and their families. So our thoughts and prayers are with all of you. Uh, we're here today uh, because we are all trying to seek the balance, right? So COVID's not going away anytime soon. Uh, if you can judge uh, by previous pandemics, uh, including um, polio is a more, one of the more recent ones, uh, this will be with us for some time, even when we get new treatments and the vaccine. So with the polio vaccine, it did take two years for 80% of the public to receive it. And uh, we anticipate uh, it's going to take a while for everyone to become comfortable with the vaccine should it become available, which is a big if. Uh, vaccine development is very, very true. In the extremes, uh, we can go around and make believe there's nothing happening, uh, which is totally foolhardy, and you're going to put yourself and others at risk. And you can shelter in place and do nothing. And as we've reviewed in the past meetings, uh, that goes with considerable risk as well. We are very, very fortunate today. Uh, we have a little different group than last time. I want to thank Dr. George Malikian and Dr. Louis Nigerian for joining us last week. This is going to be uh, a little bit more pragmatic as opposed to more medical. Uh, and we have Dr. Garby Spadar and Dr. Lynn Satine, who are esteemed pediatricians in our New York, New Jersey communities. And, who have been involved in the Hognanian and Holy Martyrs Day Schools. Uh, we have Dr. Celine Kojiklanyan, who has been truly uh, an expert in this area and has been so generous with her time to share with us. Uh, doc Dr. Nazar Naltoun, I just changed your title and name. Uh, Nazar is a uh, attorney who is chairman of the board of the Hognanian School and will be sharing with us some of the things that they're doing there. And by the way, this is an open conversation, so you're all welcome to share your ideas with us. Uh, just when you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Um, please mute yourself. So, and we also have Dr. Kim Akimian, who, who is an amazing uh, public health expert, uh, who will share some of the public health concepts behind COVID with us and answering the questions. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I'll be monitoring our email, info at oppo.org. That's info at oppo.org. Uh, and also the chat for this evening. Uh, the meeting today is, all, is gonna be our second private one, but we are planning a public one in the next several weeks. So if you can continue to email us your questions, that will help us for the public one. And you're all invited to uh, share the Zoom webinar with all of your followers as well uh, for that next meeting. Uh, this question is directed to Dr. Bedar and Dr. Satine. And, uh, Doctors, uh, we all hear about the flu. Um, is it important for children to be vaccinated for the flu? And is there anything different about this year that getting the flu vaccine is very important? Well, thank you, Larry, for doing this for the entire community. I don't know how you actually do your regular work with all the work you've done with COVID this year. Um, to jump in, uh, every year as pediatricians, we recommend that uh, the children get the flu vaccine because we know that children can get very ill from the flu, especially very young children. This year has a very special um, quality to it because when kids get sick in the fall season, as a pediatrician, we are going to have a dilemma as to figure out if that fever is due to flu or is it COVID because fever is one of the major symptoms of the COVID um, virus. So as pediatricians, we feel that if more and more children get vaccinated against the flu and less present with flu illness, um, hopefully we'll have less children coming into our office with these um, fevers of unknown origin um, and we'll have to do less testing. Because we know as pediatricians, and I'm sure Garbis is already thinking about this for the fall season, we need a 
a disaster plan for the influx of kids that may potentially come in on a daily basis with the symptom of fever who are sent home from school. And if we need to test these children for flu and, and COVID, every child, we are going to be well. So if we can prevent some flu illness and prevent less of those children coming to the office, at least we can decrease our stress level as parents and teachers, um, but also as doctors so we can take care of the uh, things that we can't, we don't have a, uh, uh, a treatment plan for. So yes, we are already have a battle plan for flu clinics in my office starting as early as the first week of September. Uh, thank you so much for that information. Uh, Dr. Badar, um, we, children are required by law to get uh, the measles vaccine, tetanus vaccine, diphtheria, uh, but they're not required by law to get the flu vaccine. In fact, only six states require it for preschoolers. Uh, does that imply there's something wrong or dangerous about the flu vaccine? I don't think there is anything dangerous about the flu vaccine, but there is a lot of misconception in the community. You know, vaccines are not good. We are, my child is pure. Why do I have to give a foreign medicine to my child? Uh, there are some, uh, uh, clearly there's an anti-vaccination leak in the United States and it's getting stronger because of fear of me, autism and all that. And there are some uh, parents who get very, very uh, almost angry if you offer them the vaccine. But thank God they are not the majority. The majority want to get get vaccinated. And I do recommend the flu vaccine to all my patients in whatever age they are, adults too. And I, I tell them I get it every year myself and uh, I'm healthy and nothing bad happened to me. And I give it to my kids, to my family, everybody gets it. And in New Jersey, I don't know how it is in New York, but it is required by schools un until I believe uh, uh, kindergarten. And then mm -hmm. first and sec after that, uh, you know, after once they're like six, seven, eight years old, it's not required. Uh, school nurses wouldn't, wouldn't take them to school if they're not flu vaccinated until they are like five years old. But uh, why it's not uh, mandated after age five, I think it's more political reason than medical reason. I see. Uh, and uh, the uh, number of children that get the flu vaccine by the CDC is 63%. Uh, so am I hearing both of you saying that you would both love to see it at 100%? We'd love to see any vaccine at 100%. Um, that would make our lives in much easier and the children more healthy. I'm actually surprised at 63% because I don't, I don't think 63% of my patients get the flu vaccine, but each year it's more and more. It's becoming more mainstream to get the flu vaccine. Great. Now, uh, we're on, focusing on children, but Dr. Kojiglanian is an infectious disease expert. Um, why is it important for children to be vaccinated and what's the impact on adults and should adults be vaccinated as well? We do have a lot of experience with influenza, unlike COVID-19. And we do know that every single year, kids are a major vector, meaning they are the major transmitter of uh, influenza virus to each other and to adults. When we look at the hospitalization rate and death rate uh, secondary to influenza, we do know that uh, in children zero to four years old, the hospitalization rate is up to 10 per 100,000 children in the population. And that is way higher than COVID-19. And if we look and if we compare that number to adults, it is equivalent to anybody who is above 60 years of age. So any child under five and any adult above 60 is going to be hospitalized at a rate of 10 per 100,000 per population. And those are much, much, much higher than for COVID-19 in children. So therefore, uh, and mortality, we have lost almost on a yearly basis in the past 10 years between 100 and 300 children to influenza. So that's another reason why children should be vaccinated. And of course, adults, we do know that even though the burden of disease is low in kids with COVID-19, we do know that the main risk factor for, for uh, COVID-19 is, is aging above 60 and up. So if there is anything we can do to any adult above 60 to prevent febrile illness, to prevent hospitalization, to prevent death, <coughs> and to prevent co-infection, 
so uh, by co-infection we mean you can be infected both with influenza and COVID-19 at the same time and you can imagine the morbidity associated with having two severe viral infections therefore we should grab every single opportunity we have to prevent uh, this disease and therefore I urge the community to go get vaccinated as soon as the vaccine arrives to your doctors and pharmacists. Just to show you uh, how uh, profound it is, uh, we don't think of the flu as a deadly disease, but every year since 2010, on the average, sometimes more, sometimes less, 56,000 Americans will die from the flu. Um, so we do all need to pay attention. Oppo uh, is considering doing a pilot program to help boost the flu vaccine. Uh, and we may be looking for team captains from your various charities and churches and schools uh, to help us implement this on a grassroots level. Uh, this is in the planning stage, but we would look forward to your help in doing that. Um, Dr. Kojiklan, you did, you did mention something that uh, was interesting. Uh, you mentioned that the flu, the children are a big vector or Vector is a scientific word, uh, but children are, are big spreaders of the flu. Um, but is that true with the corona, novel coronavirus? As we discussed last week, I know most of you here today uh, were also here last week, and uh, we presented the data available so far which is very few, uh, maybe a handful of papers looking at uh, this phenomenon, basically uh, the, whether kids can transmit the infection to adults. And from the data that we have, which is mostly coming from Europe, uh, although uh, recently since last week, we do have a couple of uh, incidents that also happened in the United States uh, that has been published. We do know that it seems, it seems that children do not very uh, strongly transmit disease from uh, themselves to adults. Why do I say we do not uh, think so yet? Because uh, we do not uh, believe this is final yet because most of these studies coming from Europe were when the schools were still closed. Therefore, most of the kids were at home. Therefore, the opportunity of transmission in a school setting has yet to be determined. Uh, so, uh, and another section of this is that when we look at age differences, kids under nine seem to be actually the low transmitters compared to kids above nine. So kids above nine, uh, they uh, seem to transmit just like an adult would transmit. So therefore, we cannot answer that question fully yet. With the scarce data that we have, it doesn't seem like kids are running the show or are the vectors or are the main transmitters, but we cannot say that for sure. Thank you so much. Uh, this next few questions will be for Dr. Hakimian and for Mr. Altoon. Um, this is a such a prickly question about going back to school uh, because we know the novel coronavirus is a huge public health issue, uh, but we also know not going back to school is a public health issue. So we're dealing with these two huge issues. Uh, Dr. Hakimian, how do we balance these two issues? How do we go about making a decision on which issue is more important? So I don't specialize in the field of school education and elementary school kids. And I know that there is statements from the American Academy of Pediatrics and other um, organizations and professional organizations that have described the incredible importance to children's cognitive, social, psychological continued development by going back into a school setting. Um, from a public health perspective, however, um, we are concerned about schools reopening in areas that have increasing rates of transmission. And so um, I think the decision needs to be made in balance. And I think as um, Solin just mentioned, the fact is that the world locked down at a time um, and sent their children home, we don't have a lot, a lot of information yet about school reopening. So we are getting that information from other countries and other areas within the United States that have recently begun to do that. And I think that as we see the data, we'll have a better sense. And my sense is that that's why the recommendations are for staggered openings and um, also an emphasis on flexibility. Um, as many of you in this call might know, New Jersey recently on Monday, reversed course and made more restrictive the number total number size of the uh, of a of a uh, an indoor gathering to 25% um, of space or a maximum of 25 people whichever number is lower 
And that was a reversal because they started to see um, the rates of transmission go up higher. And so there's going to be this fall, this, this tug back and forth. They're reopening, doing sure. testing and surveillance, finding transmission, restricting. Restricting until the numbers come down and then reopening. Yeah, so uh, as a lawyer, you get to make the counterpoint, uh, <laughs> the impact of children not going to school. Why is it so critical? In terms of whether the, the you know, how the children are impacted by not going to school, I can't speak uh, from any psychological or psych psychiatric perspective, but just from, an, from what we've observed at our school, uh, you know, some, some children actually thrive under, uh, through their remote education. They prefer to be by themselves. They prefer to be on the screen and kind of figure out their own ways of dealing with that class. And some children really, really struggled with the lack of social interaction, with the lack of being in, the, you know, in real life contact with the teacher and with their friends. Um, so I, I don't think there's one blanket statement that online education is bad for the kids or being in school is better for the kids. We do at the school believe that in-person is better, uh, not in, only in terms of maximizing learning, but in terms of maximizing their social uh, you know, interactions. And in fact, for most you know, younger elementary school children and even and, and younger still, kindergarten, early learning, the social aspect is the most important part of school, if you ask me. I mean, this is when they're learning how to deal with their peers, how to deal with conflict. Um, so, so without that, it's very difficult for those children to actually uh, become acclimated to their peers and then get to a position where they can learn. So we believe school is very important. Uh, I agree with Dr. Akimian that, you know, not one size does not fit all with any of this. Um, we are lucky to be a school with a small uh, population. We have 135 students. Uh, and we have a very large facility. So we're able to open our school and have all of the children in class, socially distanced, six feet apart, uh, following all CDC and state guidelines. And so, and all of our classrooms have many windows that open, et cetera. So, and we have outdoor classrooms set up. So we feel confident that we're minimizing the risk of bringing the children into the school. As a board member, you know, we also think about the liability for the school and what that means uh, in terms of our opening decision. And we realize that when you open a school, uh, we're not gonna have, you know, there's not gonna be zero cases of COVID. We hope it's zero, but the likelihood is there's going to be some risk, but we, we, we think that the balance in terms of the, the benefit to the kids coming back in a socially distanced environment uh, trumps that, you know, zero risk tolerance stance. So that's where we are right now. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we're very fortunate that um, we have Mr. Armin Murian, uh, who was the chair of the Armenian Bar Association in New York. Uh, he also is the president of the board at, at St. Illuminators. Uh, you mentioned uh, Nazar. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll use your first names. We're becoming chummy on the Zoom call now. Uh, oh, you mentioned uh, the legal uh, liabilities. I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Morian, uh, if you might have any ideas on those legal liabilities for us uh, conducting our Sunday schools, our churches, or uh, Armenian schools. Uh, hi, Larry. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, just um, uh, to correct the record, not, not the, I'm just a member of the board of the New York, New Jersey chapter of the Armenian Bar Association, uh, but I am the chairman of the board at St. Luke Leaders. So, you know, I wish I could answer the question more directly, but we haven't had to confront it because um, while we have had sun Saturday and Sunday schools in the past, um, recently we haven't. So we haven't had to grapple with that question at all. And we simply grappled with the question of how we reopen church. And, uh, you know, we managed to navigate that uh, thing, you know, it's a relatively easier set of, of, of issues, obviously, than, than dealing with, uh, with schools. Um, so, I mean, I think it might help if, if there's a particular question that I could sort of, that could help frame my, uh, you know, my answer. So basically, this is a novel area. Uh, there have been some talk in political circles about yeah. giving uh, legal relief to all businesses. Uh, it's something in the back of our minds, but it sounds like we should be uh, making our decisions based on what's best for our children, what's best for our families and worry about the consequences later. 
I think that's true. And I think as long as, uh, look, I mean, um, the decision making by organizations, uh, you know, and their managements, okay, are driven by their fiduciary obligations. As long as they meet their fiduciary obligations and don't uh, act recklessly, they generally get the benefit of the presumption of what's called the business judgment rule. And I think that that applies uh, in most jurisdictions to uh, nonprofits as well. So it's really about, uh, about informing yourself and making careful decisions. Um, and I think um, that's probably the best guide, right? You don't want to do anything reckless, um, but you also don't want to live in fear of the law, right? I mean, we have to live our lives somehow. We have to strike the balance. And I think that's probably the best uh, thing that I could say about it. And we're all trying to strike that balance and not live in fear of the coronavirus and learn how to, to live with it. Um, Dr. Bedar, um, you've been a wonderful pediatrician to so many Armenian families uh, and American families over many years. What is your perspective on childhood development, uh, the impact of social distancing, not playing with their friends, uh, and just sheltering in place uh, during this epidemic? It is crucial for children to <clears throat> play together in, in terms of uh, their cognitive development, their speech development, uh, you know, social interaction, learning how to socially interact with each other. And uh, there are some studies which show, you know, children who are deprived from it, they can develop uh, psychological issues. You know, they can, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I know that they can develop depression. And I'm seeing it lately in my patients. I'm seeing it mostly in my teenage population, they are getting uh, depressed. There's uh, more drug abuse, there's more, uh, you know, depression, anxiety. I mean, a lot of my teenage patients are ask, asking for Xanax lately, which I'm not prescribing. Lynn is gonna agree with me on that for various reasons. So I, to answer your question, uh, for, I mean, as we said, you know, as I'm hearing for everybody is no like, uh, one size fits it all solution here. You have to see the pros and cons. I get this question uh, at least 10 times every day in my practice. Is it safe to send my child to school? Parents, in my opinion, want to send their kids to school, but they're afraid. Is the child going to get COVID? Is the child going to get very sick? Is the child going to make me sick? Is the child going to make the grandma and grandpa sick? There's a lot of fear in the society. Uh, but I tell them, you know, when you drive uh, from your home to my practice, you took a risk. You drove in a car, it could have gotten into an accident and died. So there's always risk. We have to weigh the pros and cons. You know, if your child is going to be depressed at home, do you want that? Or do you want to take that maybe small risk of sending your child to a school like Omnayan, which is, uh, you know, not, not a huge number of school? And, uh, and they're being very careful about social distancing and, and hand washing and masks and all that. And uh, then you wanna take that risk and send your child to school. But if you, if you have type two diabetes, you're overweight and you have, a, you have a father who lives with you, who is on chemotherapy, then you may not wanna take the risk. I think everybody has to take that decision on their own. Children are not just all black, all healthy. We wish they were. Um, but when you advise families, which children are you more concerned about who may develop COVID and whose parents and teachers and administrators really have to be guided uh, with more wisdom on the decision for that individual child? I'll, I'll start off, Garbis. Um, certain populations we worry about more about getting severe illness. Um, obesity, also in children, there's a lot of obese children. We worry about type one diabetics. High up on the list are kids who have immunocompromised systems, kids who are going through chemotherapy. Um, and I would also put in that list, even though not a health problem on, in and of themselves, but if they live in a family where there is someone who fits the criteria of um, a medically fragile adult in that family. Another thing to think about is um, there are children out there with neurological disorders, autistic children. Um, those children tend to fare, I think, not as well 
with this kind of illness. So we have to be considerate of that population also. But definitely immunocompromised in type 1 diabetics um, and children on chemotherapy. And can you just define immunocompromised for us? Uh, children who have immune systems that are weakened for a variety of reasons, if I, in layman's terms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bigar, would you like to add to that at all? I will add, uh, I will add severe asthma to, I agree with all them says, obviously there are risk factors. I will also add not just mild intermittent asthma, but severe uh, persistent asthma, I will add to the high risk uh, list. Dr. Kondiglanyan, uh, Drs. Bedar and Satin very nicely summarized uh, the major risk factors, uh, diseases, red flags that we should be aware of. Uh, in your best judgment on a macro, you can't talk about each individual, but in general, would you advise these children stick to uh, homeschooling virtually, or would you still recommend in-person uh, education? I think that's a tough question. Uh, it's not easy. I think each individual family, as we said, have, has to assess the risk uh, of their child and everybody in it. I would say all children can get COVID-19, right? Even though we defined the risk factors, but that doesn't mean that other children will not get it. As I said, we, they could get mild illness with it, but all children are going to be infected. And I think in order not to divide, uh, you know, children who already have chronic illnesses that Lynn and Garbis nicely defined, already have a medical issue that you know puts them at a difference they might have to use inhalers inject insulin so in order uh, to separate them even further from their peers I don't think it's a good idea uh, so I, I would say if we're opening schools everybody should come in and just uh, do all the precautions uh, and so that everybody gets an equal chance of, of uh, being uh, getting the instruction in person and being with their peers it sounds like the consensus here before we move to the next topic is parents and students and teachers beware. Uh, be in close communication, whether it be in a public or a private or a Catholic or Armenian school, uh, with your uh, leadership in those institutions. Make sure that your child's issues are known. And so this way, everybody can have a heightened awareness. Uh, as with everything, the sooner you catch a problem and recognize a problem, the better it is for everybody involved. Uh, this next question is for Dr. Akimi, and we're now going to shift gears more to the public health issues of COVID that we all need to be aware of. And um, I gave a talk, it's called Know Before You Go, uh, Know uh, Where You're Going, What the Region You're Going To. Uh, Dr. Akimi, uh, what objective criteria can families use to decide whether the amount of community transmission or spread within the community of this virus is safe enough? Uh, to allow to open schools. So, I mean, part of the issue is that there aren't, there isn't really a consensus on what that percentage should look like, and there has been a decentralized um, a form of decision making about that. So, in New Jersey, New Jersey schools will follow the guidelines from the governor of New Jersey. New York will do the same for New York. There's also city guidelines for those who are within Manhattan. Um, uh, jurisdiction for municipalities. So the um, Bill de Blasio and the mayor office will also be making those kinds of decisions. So I think you know, even when we see sometimes community transmission rates go up very high, if we know the source and the cluster of those cases, for example, there may be a county in a state that has a very high transmission rate because of an outbreak in a particular manufacturing plant or something there. Um, and then so we, we can then sort of assess our exposure to that. But what's happening is that more and more there's community transmission where we really can't assess whether or not we've been exposed or not as a general community overall. And so what you want to look for is not only the rates of increasing cases and the rates of percent of positive tests out of total tests, you also want to be in a community that has good testing capacity so that you know that the community itself can identify cases um, early enough for that testing to be effective as a tool for reducing transmission. And you also, therefore, in collaboration with testing capacity, you also need contact tracing capacity. I would say that for Bergen County, New Jersey, we're doing okay in both of those capacities, but I still would warn everyone who is um, 
you know, opening up and for example, Nazar, when you're opening up and thinking about testing, and I think Garvey's, you can speak to this better in terms of the testing that you're doing for pediatric populations. Here in Ridgewood, New Jersey, this area where I live in Bergen County, there are a number of testing facilities, but they're still taking sometimes upward of seven to 10 days to return the test result. And that's a problem when you're trying to decide whether or not a classroom, Nazar, for example, in Hovnanyan, my three children are graduates of Hovnanyan school, by the way, um, whether or not a classroom has a positive case and it takes some, it could take some time. So another thing that you want to decide as a community in opening up your Sunday schools or opening up um, your private, the private Armenian schools that are on the call is um, does your community have um, testing capacity and can you facilitate that for your community members, for your students and their families if they are symptomatic or they have had an exposure, how confident are you that you can communicate to them um, the following steps uh, that need to be taken in order to determine whether or not there has been a, an exposure that requires further um, you know, follow-up. Uh, we do have a, another wonderful question. Uh, it's something that we touched upon before, but I think it really bears repeating. Uh, and the question really is about the flu vaccine help in any way with COVID. And I'll, I'll put my two cents in and I look forward to the panelists. Uh, the, there's multiple reasons for getting the flu vaccine. Uh, primarily what the flu uh, is deadly and the flu can spread to loved ones, uh, particularly if you're in a public position where you meet people as a physician, as a priest. In fact, physicians are required uh, in many, many hospitals in the United States to get their flu vaccine. Um, and um, I've been doing it for years as many of the physicians on the, on the line have. So for your own personal good, uh, it's great for your, it's your civic duty uh, to get the vaccine so you don't spread this vaccine to others, particularly the most vulnerable people, the older people, people with other diseases like cancers, heart failure, um, pro problems breathing, asthma. Uh, I think we would all feel horrible. From a public health perspective, the primary reason for getting the flu vaccine uh, is to decrease the hospital load. Um, as you've seen uh, in the New York, New Jersey area, now unfortunately, Texas, California, Florida, Missouri, and elsewhere, um, hospitals are being overwhelmed with COVID disease, intensive care units, hospitals, intensive care units are being totally occupied in New York hospitals. They were at multiple 100, 200, 300% of their normal volume. They literally created intensive care units out of cafeterias and situations and hallways. So we don't want people in the hospital. We want people that are ill to get better. We want to, don't want to just detract from the limited healthcare resources we have. There's a limit to everything. Uh, and we need doctors and healthcare providers to pay attention to the most critically ill. So the flu vaccine is one way to decrease that hospital load. Um, and also, I would add, Larry, that we do know that the flu vaccine works. As uh, Garbis and Lynn said, there is misinformation out there that it's not great, it's toxic, it causes the flu. All of them uh, over and over, over proven to be truly uh, misconceptions. We do know that it significantly reduces what we call in the medical world morbidity and mortality. So morbidity means hospitalization, severe illness, secondary complications, pneumonia. Pneumonia is a major, major uh, complication of influenza and that's really what kills people. Um, so number one. And number two, I know also that you know you read in the, in the media that it's only 50% effective, 60% effective. Yes, unfortunately, it is not as good as some of our other vaccines, but even with its 50%, 60% efficacy, it's still better than zero, number one. And number two, if you do get the flu uh, vaccine, despite being vaccinated, there is many data showing that the disease is much milder. So it won't put you in the hospital. It won't put you, it won't uh, kill you. So honestly, uh, really no harm whatsoever. It is a killed vaccine. Some people think that it's a live vaccine, you know, like uh, the one in the nose used to be a live vaccine. We're not doing that anymore. It's, it's really the most, I mean, the safest, the least painful vaccine you can get. And this year is going to be crucial to prevent uh, double infections with these double uh, whammies. Yeah, and uh, so again, it's safe and effective. It's tried and true. Uh, it is true that some people, when they get the flu vaccine, might develop some muscle aches and maybe a little tiredness for a few days. 
uh, that's actually good. That means your body is reacting to the vaccine and you're developing immunity. Uh, so again, that's not the flu. Those are weak symptoms, which indicate your body is responding. But this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I really want to thank our panelists who have been outstanding and all of our guests. Uh, we have a great question. And in a few moments, I'm going to each ask each panelist to give their closing remarks. Uh, but the question was, there is a child, no matter what you do, just can't wear the face, ma face mask. And it doesn't work for him or her. Uh, can they use a shield? that covers the face in place of the mask. Two reasons why a child cannot wear a face mask. Either they're just not going to, which means they're probably not going to be put, uh, keep the face shield on either, right? Uh, so if there is just their uh, clumsiness or whatever reason they're too young to keep the mask on, they're probably going to be too young or too clumsy to keep the face shield on. But if the question is if there is a certain contraindication to wear the face mask, they have a respiratory problem uh, that they cannot wear face masks, then face shields should be uh, an alter can be an alternative. It's not ideal, like Larry said, but it, it is better than not having anything. Great. So um, I, I don't see any more uh, questions. I, I want to thank everybody. Uh, again, if there's questions, you can email us at oppo.org. And we promise we'll be putting on one for the public. And uh, we appreciate your help in helping us develop this program so it's better for public consumption.